and this is the first episode of Behind the Business. I'm here with Lena McFerrin of Wolf Creek Brewery, and we're here to talk about her business of 22 years. I am so blown away and impressed by what you have created, starting from a hobby in your garage with your husband. So maybe tell us a little bit about that, about how you guys actually started from the hobby in the garage with, with Rob to now being a restaurant and the other um, facets that you guys have. So Rob and I met working together at the Cheesecake Factory in Marina Del Rey a million years ago, I would say. <laughs> uh, we are actually uh, going to celebrate our 29th wedding anniversary wow. next week. Next week? Wow. The 30th, actually, this weekend. So. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. Um, so we met working in the restaurant industry. One year for Christmas, right when we were first married, I bought him a home brewing kit. We both were really into beer and wine at that time, and the craft beer industry, the first wave of it was just starting to happen. So with much trepidation, I bought this kit and was really not sure that anything drinkable would ever come out of it, <laughs> and was pleasantly surprised with the first batch of beer, which was in fact made in our kitchen and aged in our garage and f was great. Really. Was it, did it have any flavor or anything? Like was it a certain kind of beer? Like what? I do not remember. Okay. What the first beer, <laughs> yes, it had flavor, but okay. I don't remember what, I, I imagine it was a pale ale or okay. something of the sort that we brewed. Um, and it was along the lines of where we were, you know, Sam Adams, Ankerstein, okay, gotcha. Sierra Nevada, those were kind of what was happening at that time, yeah. really the only craft. And from there, sort of the germ of an idea was born. That was the first wave of brew pubs that were happening at that time. And which were still like very like kind of speakeasy ish, like you couldn't find them too much, right? Not the first round. The first yeah. rounds were actually restaurants with breweries. Gotcha. So that during the, the 90s, what they were were basically pubs that had this brewing component. And many of them did not have very good food. And they were just, uh, you know, this kind of oddity or curiosity. It's cool. They make their beer there. Right. But often neither the beer or the food, food. was that great. Yeah. Now, notable uh, exceptions to that would be Gordon Biersch, right. who started uh, in the early 90s. Um, we had Rock Bottom, um, which has started in Colorado and was out for a while. And so there were BJ's, yeah. has been around for a long time, who were people that actually knew what they were doing on the restaurant side and were making beer. beer yeah. So for us, having had all of the experience that we had working together in the restaurant, we felt like this might be a really good fit. We had moved out to Santa Clarita in 1992, mm -hmm. and the restaurants were few and far between at yeah. that time. Especially, you know, like- Well, this area wasn't even built. Right. Where but, we're sitting right yeah. now was a thought at yeah. that point. It was the mall. The mall had just opened the TGIF Fridays and right. the Sicily, and it really, like, that was exciting for the people out here. Right. We had lived on the west side, of LA where mom and pop restaurants were on every block. And that was one of the things that we missed most yeah. about living out here was the ability to go to unique, interesting little neighborhood restaurants. Did you come out here to start a business or did you come out here for your family? Start a family. Okay. At the time, Rob was working for the Cheesecake Factory uh, in Woodland Hills. And- A um, little bit of a drive. It was a bit of a drive. Yeah. But we wanted a place that we could buy a house and raise a family. Yeah. And you can't do that in LA, or no. we couldn't on the salaries that we were making at the right, time. Right, right. And I was managing a small independent restaurant in Pacific Palisades, and I learned so much from the gentleman that, that he was, owned that. He was kind of like your mentor Absolutely. as you guys kind of got started, yeah. huh? Yeah. He had done the same, started it with a partner, and gave us a lot of advice and a lot of help. Yeah. And what we tried to do was merge the experience because I had worked for the Cheesecake Factory, that's where Rob and I met, right. and I was their trainer for their servers at the time. So merging that level of experience that we had with a big restaurant and the, um, the consistency that the Cheesecake Factory was able to produce so mm -hmm. much food with such quality. Yeah. And then the 
special touches that you get in a neighborhood restaurant right. and learning about that and learning how to really get to know your neighborhood and your base and we hope to combine those when we open Wolf Creek. Yeah. Creek. Was he familiar that you guys were going to be opening a restaurant or was that was that a thought for you yet? Was when you, when the, the gentleman that you ha had as a mentor that when you're working the, the, the um, palace when we started it yes and in fact yeah. he invested yeah that's so awesome yeah I love so that. we were no competition to him we were right. too far away right. but he was a, his name was David Williams and he was a huge support to us as we were getting yeah. started both in terms of knowledge and um, a little bit financially so I love that because that is what it takes somebody mm -hmm. else to believe in you sometimes right. it's not just these two kids or a young couple right. on their like wild dream of like owning a, a pub and a restaurant or a brewery and a restaurant did you guys put together a business plan did you have any guidance to do that absolutely okay so my best friend one of my best friends from college undergrad went on and got her MBA at Harvard so when we had this crazy idea of opening a restaurant and we needed to get investors and we also were going to apply for an SBA loan right. for the equipment, we talked to her, Julie Anderson, now Julie Anderson Vlahos, <laughs> and uh, she helped us put together a business plan, which she was very comfortable with, and became our partner at that time. We raised, we did a limited partnership where we raised money in increments of ten thousand dollars each from fans and friends and family had 21 investors i think at wow. the time wow. put in our own money and did manage to secure an sba loan for our brewing equipment. that's amazing because it's so hard to do that kind of stuff yes i mean so kind of backing up a little bit um because all of that sounds like things just fell in like an alignment for you it's sort of I, I know it's no joke that it takes a lot of work yeah but um did you guys did you have you and rob did you have you know, like where, how you grew up, any entrepreneurs in your family, and like how, how did you, what made you think that this is, you're gonna now be business owners? You know, it's really crazy because we actually didn't have entrepreneurs really? in our families. My family is all educators, they're teachers. Rob's mom was a stay at home mom, and his dad worked for the aerospace industry. And okay. so we did it, and, and I don't honestly know what it was this crazy dream, but we'd worked in the restaurant industry for a long time. I loved the energy and the pace of the industry, right. but knew quite honestly that the commute and what Rob was doing at Cheesecake Factory would kill him. Right. And we thought that we knew enough to do it on our own. So I love that because that is the true essence of an entrepreneur that you right. just take the risk. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what was my favorite part of like this story with you guys. <laughs> but the other part that I wanted to know is while you were building this out, going through the business plan, do, getting the investors, getting the loans, um, kind of like deciding on the space as well because mm -hmm. that's crucial. Were you still working elsewhere? Yes. Oh man. So both of us. How did were, you find the time? I. We did our best, you know, right. we, I mean, fortunately, both of us worked a lot of nights and weekends, which means that when you're going to get permits and doing those sort of you're things, free. Ah. you're free during that time. Right. And there was many, Rob would go to the planning department pushing a stroller because <laughs> at the time, uh, right. Randy was three when we opened this. So the process, she was a baby. So yeah. we, between us, um, I remember taking her to Kinko's with me in the little carrier <laughs> as I was photocopying our business plans so great and trying to get investors yeah. and doing that I feel like that's the true definition of a side hustle but you're turning it into a <laughs> yeah. business which yeah. is a that side hustle is a term right. that a lot of people use these people days use. and a lot of people actually live their lives by it like they right. make their money to put their kids through college on a side right. hustle so like look what you guys have yeah. done you know but it's Ours um, maybe what we were thinking of as our future hustle right that's what I was gonna say <laughs> yeah. you turned it into so you were able to leave your other jobs right um, so just touching on that because you mentioned the kids I know you have two daughters right um, that are off in college now Correct. doing their thing so this new phase for you and Rob yes. but knowing that you um, you mentioned your anniversary you guys it's interesting to me that you guys have been obviously obviously you've been married the whole time during all this but it's so hard to work with your spouse for some people right you guys have seemed to make it work and I just wanted to if you could just touch on that a little bit working with your spouse and building this together right so we met working together right so obviously we both 
respected the way that the other person worked. I don't point. think that you can have a relationship with someone you work with if you don't respect it's such their a great work. Point. Yes. Right? Yes. So we started with that. It might have been harder if it had come a different way. But because that is how we knew each other to begin with, I think we knew each other's work style. We knew and we both had very different things that we're good at. Yeah. And it balanced each other very well. Yeah. So that worked for us. And then I think just in in general my advice would be um, remember that this is your partner in every every sense of the word and be careful who you vent to <laughs> right. because that's not fair it's right like when when it's all the, marriage when, as well. when your other employees are coming in complaining about their husbands or complaining about right. this you can't do that yeah it and it's a really good advice and so don't yeah <laughs> keep it within the family right. if that's what you right. have to do I think that's great advice and that's yeah. a good point that you do have to respect each other's work, work ethic if you will and the difference I think is that in all marriages there are times when you're frustrated with one another yeah. and you can sometimes vent to your friends at work or your friends at this yeah. and and so that limits that and just be right. aware of that yeah because it's it will undermine both your business and your marriage good if point. you do not follow that. great point mm -hmm. So, 22 years. Yes. 22 years of Wolf Creek. Yes. Like, that's crazy to me. Um, I think it's fantastic. But 22 years of also, you know, um, growth and failures yep. and um, just stability and some maybe not stability. Let's talk a little bit about um, a couple of the failures first, if you don't sure. mind. Because I feel like that is super important for everybody to know and hear yep. about. Because it's normal process. And right. that if you're not... If you're not failing at some point, then I'm not sure that you're actually really growing in, in what you're trying to do. That's what I would like right. to say. It yeah. can't always be sunshine and roses, right? right? So tell me about, because one of the ones that I actually remember, because I went there and I was like, they're doing what? Was the other restaurant that you opened up over on Town Center. Rio Lobo. Rio Lobo. So when I saw that, I couldn't believe that it was Wolf Creek. I just right. thought like it had a different feel and a right. vibe. and. So talk to me a little bit about that and then the other restaurant in Thousand Oaks? Correct. Is that right? Or Calabasas. Calabasas. Thank you. So Rio Lobo, which means Wolf River, so Wolf Creek I did not Spanish. know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, we basically um, have always had an affinity for Latin food, Latin culture, right. despite our appearance. <laughs> I always say that Rob was Mexican in his past life because That's he cooks say. such amazing Mexican food. Oh, I say it because I love a good margarita right. and chips and salsa. Yeah. And if you saw our house, like you would think. I've been there, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, we thought we were being really smart. We had been successful here for quite some time with too small a kitchen, too small a space, too small right. everything. And so this opportunity came up on Town Center and Drive and we thought, wow, we'll take everything we learned at Wolf Creek and yeah. turn it into a this this other bigger, type. We yeah. thought, well, we could duplicate Wolf Creek, but that just didn't seem as interesting yeah. as doing a whole nother concept well, altogether. And I want to pause for a second because you say too small a kitchen, too small a space, but that's because you guys <laughs> hit the nail on the head here. Correct. And you became the neighborhood restaurant and bar and, and everything. We I had guess. no idea that we would do the bar right. that we do. And so here. that's why I understand the need to, right. but I wanted to So we were busting out of the seams here yeah. and we thought, oh, we'll solve all these problems that we have here and just do it right the first time over there. Yeah. What we really didn't take into account was that the, the concept for Wolf Creek, we kind of hit so many different genres in food right. and so many different styles. Anybody that really, can come and eat right, here If and you're have a group, something. like everyone can find something. Right. You don't have to be in the mood for Mexican or Chinese or Indian or whatever. And so uh. when we did Rio Lobo, not only was it one genre of food, um, but we also took it a little twist on it and did kind of a, we called it Nuevo Latino, so right. a, a little more interesting twist on Mexican. And I think we were a little ahead of our time with too large of a space for the concept. For the concept. So the location was good, you think, or? It was a very different location yeah. than what we were used to here, and we didn't fully understand that okay. either. Because that does, like, location is key. So you, when you started Wolf Creek Restaurant, right. this this was nothing. You said it was like dirt. It was, it like, was we were the first tenant. Yeah. In, I mean, not so, the first, we, in this space. Yeah. Ralph's was great. open and everything basically on okay. that side of us was open. And you or, are right in a neighborhood. Correct. You're not in the city, In a neighborhood so that, that grew up around us and right. kept building around us. Right. Which was which, cool. Which, which you were the only restaurant for a yes. long time, too. So yes. it made you that destination place. 
And so the reasons why that didn't work was, just to recap, was somewhat of a location, right. somewhat of the- It was a very different location. Yeah. It's a weekend food, driven location. Like and our food being the genre. was not broad enough right. to- um, Generate the income that you needed to make it all happen. Right. So how long was that open? Four years. Four years. Yeah. That's pretty, when, when did you know it was time to close the doors? Um, probably about three years in. I think you can kind of like, you go three years because most yeah, people sure. don't expect to make a profit, right? Right, yeah, right. But then you look at your trends and you look at where you're going and how long you can sustain uh, emotionally as well right. as everything right. else if you're not quite yeah. getting it. And so we really wanted to be able to exit gracefully. We owned mm -hmm. another business in this community. Yeah. We had workers that we cared about. We had investors there, which was a different group than that had invested. A lot of overlap, but okay. a lot of people who we felt we owed that sure. they had, had invested in us. And so fortunately, we were able to sell that restaurant. And we lost, you know, we didn't, yeah. we lost everything, but um, we were able to make most people relatively whole. And, which is good. Um, and get out of the lease, which was the biggest thing. So hard, right? And um, That's we were able challenge. to offer employment to many of the people who worked for us there. And then the people who bought that location offered employment to many of the people who stayed. stayed. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. And then the one in Thousand Oaks. So or that, in so that we thought, oh well, we're smart now. <laughs> so did we, you open? Wait, did you open that the same time you no, had? No. No. Oh. Actually, we got a call from. John Maley, who is our current business partner, one day, maybe a year after Rio Lobo had closed. Okay. And um, he said, you know, have you ever thought about opening more restaurants? And we but said- But more like Wolf Creek. More Wolf Creek. Yeah. And I said, well, we actually tried that and it didn't really go very well for us. And he's like, well, would you like to sit down and talk? So sure. what do you have to lose, right? Right, right. So we ended up meeting with him and talking to him and long story short, we became partners with John. John wanted to grow the Wolf Creek concept and uh, he bought out the rest of our partners and we formed wow. a partnership there. Okay. And then the, at that point, um, it still was early on in the production brewery growth it, and we felt that the growth was going to be in the restaurant. So we opened, uh, looked for probably a year and a half for a location found this location in Calabasas that we thought would be a great location. Yeah, yeah. Um, spent too much money building out. In the space? That space. Yeah. Uh, took I remember it, I thought it was really classy. Space, yeah. yeah, I thought it was really um, nice. And the other thing was, it was in a neighborhood, but it wasn't our neighborhood. Right, it's and, a little bit more. And one of the things that has been a big part of our success here is our involvement in the community. Right. And we didn't have that there. Yeah. There were a lot of other things going on that we had no idea about, that the neighborhood was boycotting the shopping center because they didn't like the architect. They, there was all sorts of things that yeah. not doing something in your own community is a risk. That's and a really good point. I feel like that's great for other people that right. want to start a business. Like if you can do it in your community, I would recommend that right. because you just know that better. Yes. Um, I don't think there's any one reason why that failed. I think we didn't execute as well as we could have. Like a few things There's happened. multiple things. Yeah, like you yeah. can't blame it on this yeah. one thing or the other. But you but, learn from both of those. But we were just under profitable in that location for four years. Oh, man. And it yeah. was so close for right. so long. But I was driving an hour every way, you know, and again, that's part where emotionally you're just like, okay. And our, and our business again. partner was putting in money to, right. to and, and after the pressure all, of that. Yeah. And it just so currently, fun. so now that you've tried to other locations as far as restaurants go, right. Wolf Creek is now the, the only, only restaurant. Yeah. Well, yeah, the only public restaurant. Right. In, in, right. right. Yeah. In Valencia that you have here. Um, and so. I, I actually love the ideas that you guys took the risk to try and do it. Mm -hmm. How did you think you would manage all those restaurants? Like, were you actually here and there? And yeah, the goal was that we would staff it. Like, okay. right, like right now we have a GM, we have a kitchen manager, we right. have all that. And the goal was that 
we would fully staff all of that and I would oversee it. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, kind of like a district manager sure, or something sure. like that. Um, unfortunately, as things got tighter and tighter, you became an employee to do that. Yeah. And, and that became super yeah. stressful. And so moving over to where, the because you had to relocate the brewery, like, or so, so, um, we were about two years into, uh, Calabasas when we thought, okay, you know what, this production brewing right. is where things are happening. We did not put a second brewery in the Calabasas location. We just, running numbers, felt like it made more sense to, right. and for consistency, to keep the yeah. beer made in one All place. In one spot, right. And we couldn't really manage what we were doing with this space here. So we found a great uh, opportunity in the Rye Canyon Loop location. Right. Which is like the industrial business type, right. which, which is, is so where most breweries are now. Yeah. So, so yeah. that, and that business was just exploding at that yeah. point, all of these tasting rooms, all of this. And so yeah. we thought, oh, we'll kill two birds with one right. stone. We'll expand our brewing op ability, have the second uh, tasting room. Right and go from there. Which is so great because that location turned out to be so great. It, great it also location. became like an event space for right. you, which yeah. kind of leads me into the next thing. So you've got these different types of revenue streams, if you will. Right. You've got the restaurant. You you guys are huge caterers out here yes. in, the, uh -huh. in the area, which you do very well. Thank you. You've got the brewery, which has event space. You've got um, distribution because yes. now you obviously have packaged yeah. items. <laughs> And um, and you also have, which I want to touch base on, you have a little cafe kind of grab and go in one of the largest growing businesses that we have in the Santa Clara right. Valley, which my is Scorpion. Yeah, my understanding is that they are the second largest business outside of Magic Mountain, second largest employer outside of Magic Mountain in this community. It is possible that they are now the largest The largest, employer, which is interesting because they occupy the same hill. I know. Funny? <laughs> it's so funny that yeah. they're all in one spot, competing for the mountain, yeah. if you will. No, so, I think it's great. So just just a little limelight on that. I mean, how, how did that opportunity come about and what made you say yes to that? So we were approached by Scorpion um, with the idea of building an employee cafe um, for their just for their inside, their um, in inside their location. they wanted yeah. to do um, a coffee bar and an employee cafe uh, kind of along the lines of Google the Google right. model in served, a much smaller smaller scale served breakfast and lunch breakfast and lunch okay. combination of cook to order buffet okay. uh, grab and go items that sort of thing and um, initially they wanted some insight from us on consulting on it they were. In the building that they were currently occupying, they had a corporate cafe. I remember that. And so yeah. my first question to them is, well, why wouldn't you ask them to do this? Right. Like, I want to, what, what is it that you're coming to us for? And what they said is uh, they were customers of the restaurant. They loved the restaurant. And they wanted more local, made-to-order, right. individual, not some chain roll that up in a truck and just drop off who yeah scorpion is is very yeah. much unique and so they wanted a cafe that represented their people and so they approached us um, I think neither scorpion or us really knew how different it was at the time than the business model that we were doing in the restaurant right. here um, but fortunately, I was able to reach out and through actually College of the Canyons culinary program, Chef Daniel Otto there, uh, recommended uh, someone to me who is now our chef, Evelyn Contreras, yeah. who had a lot of experience working in um, at LMU as a, a so a oh, similar right. environment, right. not quite as upscale, but in terms of the logistics and how to manage the logistics and also the volume for that amount of people. Right. Um, we were able to figure it out, and That's we worked great. with them on consulting and opened it up, and it's been it's been really fun. Yeah, I bet. And how long have you been doing that now? Almost two, uh, more than two years. More than a little over two years. Yeah. yeah. So out of all of those revenue streams, which one A is your favorite to kind of do and 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 be a part of, and what, not to not to like what, but and which one actually generates the most revenue for you, if you don't so mind sharing? I'm going to answer that question <laughs> like I do on what's your favorite beer. <laughs> I, right. That is like asking which one is my favorite child. Child, right. Okay. And the answer is it depends on the day. I love that. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Yeah, we'll okay. accept that answer. So right now the restaurant is the most profitable for what we do. Okay. Um, with Scorpion coming in a close second. Okay. Love it. So the capital investment in the brewery is huge. Is the best, and yeah. And so that makes it. 
So shifting gears a little bit, some kind of like fun things that like uh, that I would just want to get to know you and Rob a little bit more. Sure. Um, because you did mention your involvement in the community and how long you guys have been here in right. Santa Clarita Valley, which actually makes it such great that your business owners here, you're investing back in the company or in, in the community in which you live. Um, talk to me a little bit about the nonprofits that you guys work with and like and kind of um, why you choose to work with them as far as like your business and personally as well. Right. So from the beginning, our business model has always been about giving back to the community. Right. We don't spend a lot of money on advertising. Instead, we donate our product, our time, whatever it is to different nonprofits in right. the community. And in the beginning, that was because I felt like if I could just get my product in front of people They'll and like do it. a good job, right. then they'd come back. Yes. And what we found... As actual really, customers. As customers. Yeah. Yeah. And what we found is that the person who comes in because you donated a gift certificate to something that they care about right. is a much easier customer to convert yeah, than somebody who has a coupon. If right. they have a coupon, they're looking for something to be wrong because why else would you be discounting it? Right. Why else would you... Right? But yes. if you gave away something because you believe in their cause, yeah. then they're much likely to want to like you. Yeah. And share and tell other people right. about it. Yeah. So it's a great way of marketing. Right. 100%. And for us, that worked. Mm -hmm. And and I also very firmly believe that we have been really well supported by the community and it is our responsibility to give back to yeah, that same I love community. That. And so, so the combination of those two things, I mean, it's good business. Yeah. It's such a good message, Lena, too, to get that out because you know, a lot of people will come out like, you know, what's what's the latest marketing trend or like how do we, and really, and, and maybe it is because you have a tangible product, like I'm wondering it's about easier. that. Yeah. yeah, it's easier. Yeah. Um, but it is such the best way to be able just to get involved. It's also great branding. The more that you're out in the community, you get seen more. Right. So, and we always, people will ask, people, right. it's, um, you know, the equivalent of just, I liken it when I do events at the brewery I always have two or three people asking me, how can they do an event at the Which brewery? Which is so great, yeah. Right? So, when so again, you, you pull off a successful event, it right. turns another business. Right. Yeah, that's so, so great. you know, for us, that's just how where I came from. One of my, my mentors early on, he did that. It's kind of the giving away a dessert yeah. to a new customer for no particular reason. Right, on How often do you get yeah. have that happen to you. It doesn't yeah. happen very often. Usually you only get something for free if you throw a temper tantrum. Right. <laughs> and I prefer rewarding good behavior, you yeah. know, and, and try and train my staff to do the same Which thing. Which is really a great, so, great model. Yeah. And in terms of what charities we support right. and what nonprofits, we've supported dozens yeah. over time. Basically my only um, parameters are that they are local and okay. supported locally yeah, cool. and not political. Yeah, I do not hey. get involved in politics right, <laughs> right. with my business. Right. Um, so those really are the parameters. And I'll support all different types of charities through our community pints, yeah. through fundraisers. We do cornhole tournaments at the brewery. We do uh, restaurant fundraiser nights here. We participate in Taste of the Town, which was one right. of the first, uh, for Child and Family Center, one of the first charities that I became really, really involved, involved in. with. Yeah. Um, I, we've, I've been on the board of the Red Cross when we had a Red Cross out here. That was actually the first board that I sat on. Oh, wow, yeah. And College of the Canyons were the, the three um, boards that, that I have on. sat on. You've been a mentor to me on all that. Oh, That's I for think. sure because when I first was involved with Child and Family Center as well, just listening to you, how you conduct yourself in these, it's just like you are right now, <laughs> which I appreciate because you're not trying to be somebody else. And that's also what they are attracted to is like real people, business owners in the community trying to make a real difference. So yeah. it's been and great to see that. And I think you have to that. look at it that way too because I've talked to some business owners who have sat on boards and get very frustrated six months in if they didn't get business out of the right. deal, right? Yeah, wrong and, reason, wrong and reason. Exactly. Like yeah. that's not why you do no. it. And um, I think ultimately business may come from that or sure. it may not right and you need to be okay with that either way yeah because you're giving your time and, mm -hmm. and that that's what matters that's why it's important to be involved with something that you're passionate about yeah, absolutely that's why i was trying to ask so like so you guys are just involved with a lot but i know that you have specific things that you are right yeah it's, which yeah. is which is important too. i have a lot of things honestly <laughs> that that really you know pull your heartstrings yeah so the child and family center we actually kind of 
backed into because of Taste of the Town. Right, right. And I tell the story, and Rob hates it when I tell the story, but basically oh, good. the Let's first, tell it. <laughs> the year that we participated, um, one of our first years out here um, was when they had it up at the Castaic like Water Gardens. Oh, right, right, right. And parking for the restaurants was extremely difficult, and the load-in and load-out was extremely oh, difficult. Right. And I believe that the volunteers that they had at that time were possibly given a set of instructions that was not super helpful to get them to, to get do it. it right so basically we pulled in and we were screamed at by the employees to move as quickly as possible we were not helped we right. were not nothing and so rob became very frustrated with this experience because we're donating yeah you're a whole lot of pro everything. i mean it's called taste of the town right. so the restaurants don't do it so but we looked at the cause, and we both felt that, what, that, that providing mental health services for children and families in Santa Clarita was a very valuable cause, and what right. they were doing was super important. And it was possible that, that maybe given a different set of instructions, it could have been a different experience. Yeah. So I called the person who had recruited, it was a committee, that had, yeah. and I asked them if they would be interested in having someone who actually worked in a restaurant Give being experience. on that committee. Yeah. Um, I did not know until much later, but initially there was some pushback. They were not interested at all. <laughs> Somebody, some people weren't. Not, right, right, probably not the high right. So I ended up joining the committee, being on the committee. Uh, over time, they did the best thing they ever did was recruit the ROTC yes. to help the restaurants load in yes. and load out. It made it a much more smooth, uh, smooth and mm -hmm. desirable opportunity for restaurants. Right. And then through that, I joined the board and I ended up being president of the board and, and I've served on that board for chairing the years event and quite chairing a the few event. Years. A couple, I, although I resisted it for so long, <laughs> but um, yeah. But so I kind of came at it backwards from that. Yeah. And then college, the College of the Canyons was a no-brainer. Um, both of my parents are public school educators. Right. I feel like uh, education for our our community and our kids is really important. Absolutely. And they do a great job. So. They do a great job. I know. I'm happy to be mm -hmm. part of that as well. And then my my thing that I'm have not sat on any boards, but really concerned about is the homeless crisis in our community right. and trying to figure out. It's a complicated problem. Trying to figure right. out how we can help. It is a complicated problem. Well, I know that, like I mentioned, that you're a mentor to me, looking through a lot of this stuff, but you've been so open about all, all of the things that you're involved with and you have no problem speaking on it. Oh. And I want more people to do that. Okay. So I'm thankful for you to be able to be a voice in that. So just to kind of wrap a couple things up here, tell me, what do you think, um, because you have a restaurant and a brewery, so right. I know it's silly. I know you're already gonna, I'm not gonna ask you about your favorite beer because you're <laughs> gonna tell me, it depends on the day. What do you think Rob's favorite dish is here at the restaurant? Mm. Can you, do, is it something that he always wants to bring home or like wants to have? You know, it's funny because I think when you own a restaurant, you eat differently in oh. that restaurant than you would going out Going to out, eat. okay. Like, so going out to eat, you always want like, ooh, what's the most interesting thing, what's a special? Yeah. But if you eat that food every day, right. we would both weigh 300 pounds. That's right. <laughs> That's true. Like if I ate Megan's dessert every, every day, day, which I would love to do. Yes, I know. And I don't eat the bread and tepidot very often because right. I just can't eat it every day. Yeah. So Rob orders chicken tacos like four days a week. Oh, here. well, those are good. And they're that's good healthy. and they're healthy. <laughs> yeah, so that's good to know. Chicken, Rob, we should call them Rob's well, chicken, tacos. chicken tacos. Yeah, yeah. it's just good. I, I don't know that that's his favorite thing on the menu, right. but it's like his go-to. His little go-to. So shifting gears a little bit, what's your favorite um, book? that because you did so, tell me that you were an avid reader I'm an avid reader I was surprised you said you binge read uh, yes which is so funny people binge watch Netflix but yeah. you're binge reading I'm a binge books. reader yeah yeah so I grew up with with educators for right. parents and grew right. up with my nose in a book forever and ever in fact when my parents would punish us it was like they would take our books away and turn off the light we wouldn't be allowed to read like oh isn't that's that funny yeah that's funny um, so I funny. my favorite book is called The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kidd. And I just, that book just touched my heart and touched my soul. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to read it. I feel like I've it. seen parts of the movie, but you know, it's never the, the same. Read I know. Yeah, I'll have to read it. It's just one of those books that even people I think who are non readers, yeah. you just get captured. It's so by. funny because I used to read all the time too growing up. That was like my, my thing, Sweet Valley High books, like mm, all that yeah. stuff, right? 
But as I got older, it became like homework and it was annoying and I didn't want right. to do it. And now I'm back to like reading, but like stuff that I can learn from. Right. I miss the joy of reading just for the story. I should read more of that stuff. We should switch. But I use it, <laughs> to me it's an escape. Yeah. Like there's so much going on so that see, I just yeah, like that. Yeah, that's a good point. I should, we should switch. I'll yeah. give you some of my books, you <laughs> yeah. give me some of yours. So, well, one last piece of advice, if you could offer other entrepreneurs or business, like, you know, restaurant owners or anybody, what, what would that be? I think it really is true that you have to do what you're passionate about mm -hmm. because it's hard and there are a lot of times when it is really hard and you're not making any money and you're and you need to enjoy what you're doing because if you just go into a business because you think oh I'm gonna make a lot of money at this when mm -hmm. times are hard you're not gonna want to keep going yeah the, and the, so we're fortunate I still love what I do that's I what's tell so people, great. You know, for me, it's the opportunity to turn someone's day around in the space of an hour. Effectively, yeah. that's what I do. Yeah, that's so great. I love that. Great piece yeah. of advice. Do what you're passionate about. Yeah. Don't fake it. It's been it's been said millions of times, but I there's know. a reason for it. There's true. And coming from and somebody who's successful. Do your research. Yeah. Do your research. Do your research. Do your research. Right. And you're still not going to know everything you need to know. No. Part of part of what you know is what you learn when you go mm -hmm. through it all. So. Well, thank you for your time today. I so You're appreciate welcome. sharing your story, but all the insights as well. It's been super fun. Um, thank you. Thank you for letting us tour around and Absolutely. take up a lot of your day. I super appreciate you being my first episode of Behind <laughs> the Business. Yes. So thank you. thank you all for watching and stay tuned for future episodes. <laughs>